Now, on occasion, I've put the word hate in the title and thumbnail of some of these videos to be a little bit extreme and attention grabbing, but y'all, they really hated this one. Oh my god, hey, welcome back to my theatre themed YouTube channel. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. Now, as well as being a theatre fan and a content creator on social media, and you can also find me on all of the other social media platforms, I'm also a professional freelance theatre critic, and so I'm always very intrigued when a show opens to see all of the reviews. And a few weeks ago, a new play opened in London that may have been the worst reviewed West End show in recent memory. I am talking about the Enfield Haunting currently running at the Ambassadors Theatre. Now, I made no attempt to go and see this on its press night because I had been hearing some word of mouth and seeing some audience reactions from the show's pre-West End run. It had played already in Richmond and Brighton and audiences were not happy. During that time, the show's running time was cut down significantly. It was a two-act show, and then by the time that it opened for the press in London, having delayed its press night, which is always a red flag, by the way, it was down to 75 minutes. Now, like I just said, I had no interest in seeing this show, but when a slew of brutal, low star rating reviews came out, I suddenly became a little bit more intrigued. Here's the thing you need to know about me. Never once in my life have I seen a five-star review for a show and gone, I must book tickets immediately. I've gone, oh, that's great. I will get around to seeing that at some point. But more often than not, if I see two-star reviews or one-star reviews of like high-profile shows with like big names in, where it's intriguing to try and see what has gone wrong in this thing that was clearly meant to be financially and critically successful, I get so intrigued that I book tickets there and then. So while I did not see this on its press night, I did see it hours later at the following day's matinee performance. And rather than give you my review of the show, I thought it would be fun to round up all of the others, talk through them, and let you know where I agree and disagree. So let's find out together. Is this a terrible show? What's wrong with this show? And why did the critics hate it? If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel where there will be many more reviews, maybe more review roundups, theatre news, cast recording reactions, all the stagey content you can imagine. And also, oh my gosh, if you have have seen the Enfield Haunting, if you saw it pre-West End, the longer version of the show, please, please, please comment down below with all of your thoughts. I have seen some positive responses from audience members to this play, and of course we all know that theatre is subjective. We all have different opinions about these things, so very intrigued to hear what anyone thought of the Enfield Haunting, and also please do not let today's video put you off of going to see the show. I love going to see one and two star reviewed shows because I like to make up my own mind about them. Sometimes I disagree completely and then and then sometimes I think no that was there yeah, that was right <laughs> so then let's find out which of those two categories this one falls into okay I'm doing this through the app stage door by the way because they have a helpful feature where they collate all of the different reviews from like the major newspaper publications that a show has had and if I can find any dissenting voices then we will read those as well. I think the best this did with the major press was three stars in The Guardian. So let's start with that first. Let's let's go in easy. So this is from Guardian theatre critic Arifa Akbar. Inspired by the inconclusive investigations into the Enfield poltergeist in North London, which led the press to a frenzy in 1977, this drama's mysteries may seem too well known for those who have seen the recent Apple TV documentary and the Sky series with Timothy Spall. The play does not set out to scare us witless, but to make us think about the nature of fear and the dynamic of a household in which a single mother, Peggy, is hiding from a violent alcoholic husband that emerges as a late stage afterthought in the script, and whose home is overtaken by the pushy male interlopers posing as protectors. Which is true, and which bothered me on her behalf very early on in this opening scene. You have the next door neighbour, who clearly feels romantically towards her, who is trying to enter the house and help protect her from the poltergeist, although he doesn't believe in the poltergeist. He's trying to convince her that her children are making it up because they're the ones who keep experiencing the poltergeist. I should say as well that we're already some time into the whole situation by the time 
time the play begins. We don't see them first discovering the poltergeist and then calling the police. We're already like months into this happening and these investigators are routinely coming around to their house in the evenings, these like paranormal experts, only one of whom we see in the play who arrives unexpectedly and then kind of overstays his welcome. Both of the men do. And so I agree that that's a factor in the play. The issue is that Catherine Tate's character is so inconsistently written. It's not a fault of the acting, and this is absolutely to do with the script. In the space of a few sentences, she will pivot whiplash-inducingly between this rage towards a man that she thinks is trying to have some sort of inappropriate sexual contact with her very young children, to then apologizing and uh, being completely polite about it. And what is even more unbelievable is that this happens with both of those different men at different points in the play. There's this sort of frenzied inconsistency to the whole thing that can only be explained by the fact that everyone is incredibly sleep deprived for much of the events of the play. Directed by Angus Jackson, the production trades on lo-fi retro horror befitting its period setting, sure, with a few disappearing tricks by illusionist Paul Kiev, which are well done. Nothing about it visually looks cheap or embarrassing, it's all slickly done enough, the problem is really the writing. But the creepiness builds as the question of who's doing this is explored. And I don't think it's explored. Explored to me gives some visual of you like traipsing through a jungle of mystery and intrigue as you come upon different options and we delve further into the possibilities and really this is not that this is us running scooby-doo style between two different doors except we're not in a corridor filled with doors we're in a room with two different doors like oh it's a poltergeist oh no it's just it's just the kids no it is it is a poltergeist oh it's the kids or is it no it's the poltergeist no the kids the poltergeist Listen, there are not enough options here to explore. The room is not big enough for us to explore. Since previews, the show, whose press night was delayed, has been honed to 75 minutes. Honed is a brave word here, and is performed straight through, mercifully. Catherine Tate has the sense of a vulnerable woman who is unable to protect her children from the men who have invaded her home and who has become afraid of her own daughter. I don't think that really got played on enough. It's all about the relationships between her and these adult men and not enough about the relationship between her and her children other than this sort of undying affection towards them. It's this constant motherly instinct no matter to what extent they're misbehaving. Like she's getting increasingly stressed by their antics but she's just constantly like now you need to be in bed. Oh look after that one. Oh I'm worried about this one. Where are his shoes? And there's only one moment right at the end of the play where she turns on them and snaps and that again doesn't feel in character. It feels abrupt and it feels almost too nasty given the context of what has happened moments before. It seems to suggest that she knows more than she's been letting on this entire time but it also just doesn't make sense. The two sisters have sinister shades of the children in Henry James's The Turn of the Screw. I was thinking The Crucible, but we'll take it. Ella Shrey Yates makes a particularly impressive stage debut as the apparently possessed Janet. I did not know that that was her stage debut. That was, that was a very confident performance. Tucked in between the scares are issues around social class, although these feel a little tacked on, don't they just? And then with little else other than a visual description of the whole thing, it ends by saying, this production may not be for those who have come for the jump scares, but as a diehard fan of the genre, it works for me in its low-level creepiness. And there, I think, is where we have what takes this review from a two-star to a three. Because I can't say I read much in that review that seemed to convey it being a three-star review, but Arifa likes the creepy vibes. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not criticizing that. And we respond to things personally as critics, and I think there's actually a benefit in addressing and acknowledging that. Recently, I said I enjoyed the play The Motive in the Queue more than Dear England because the themes and the topics within The Motive in the Queue, a play about the theatre and Hamlet, spoke more to me than Dear England, a play about football. Carrying on, let's go to our first two-star review, in the Telegraph. This was written by Dominic Cavendish, and man, the Telegraph star metric does not work in dark mode because this looks like a five-star review because they're using two different shades of gray. Not the point. He says, the scariest thing here is the ticket price. <laughs> Catherine Tate and David Thrill full star in this occasionally sharp but insufficiently shocking play about a poltergeist beset council house. Now, if he's going to go on to say that it isn't scary enough, I don't think scary is what this necessarily needs. In keeping with the marketing, sure, but the West End, including The Woman in Black and 222, has always traded on scary plays that actually aren't horrors so much as provocative psychological thrillers that ask interesting questions about character and 
relationships and instill a certain amount of just sort of simmering tension throughout. I don't think fear is the answer, but if you're going to try and build a play on a base of constant tension, you definitely need to have more to say than this one did. You want to keep an audience wrapped and engaged using tension as a tool. What are you going to tell us when you've done that? And the answer here was unfortunately little. Let's see what Dominic Cavendish does have to say. He says it was meant to open in December, but owing to cast illnesses, it's now the first major West End event in the barren month of January. I don't know if he actually believes that or if he's just writing it. I wish I could report that it's worth emerging from your duvet to investigate, but it's enough to make you repeat jab the snooze button, especially with top price tickets going for almost £165, which it's worth saying in the conversation around top price West End tickets in shows starring TV and film names, that's actually very low. What I will agree with here is the notion about it not being worth leaving your duvet for, because it is very cold at the moment. It's very cold. You may have noticed I'm wearing yet another new turtleneck. Listen, it's, it's chilly out. He also mentions the documentary, the Sky Drama series that apparently everyone other than me has watched, and the horror film The Conjuring 2. He says a theatrical treatment of the story at least offers the potential to give people a discombobulating sense of what it might have been like to be in situ. I mean, if you want to do that, do something immersive. Although that's less theatre and more the Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios. Writer Paul Unwin, who co-created Casualty, had the benefit of meeting a man who was there, the late ghost hunter Guy Lyon Playfair, who despite being aware that the girls practiced hoaxes, couldn't explain everything he encountered. He is named in the play, but he does not appear. The person who does is Playfair's associate in psychic investigation, Maurice Gross. He talks about him next. He says that he's played with an enigmatic, rather creepy air of continual, almost predatory curiosity by David Threlfall. And I want to expand on this because this was distinctly unnerving. For much of this play, you find yourself just sort of troublingly wondering whether or not he is trying to abuse his position to have an inappropriate relationship with the young girls at the house. And an explanation comes of that towards the end, but if that's not the sense that you're meant to be getting throughout the play, it is absolutely how it comes across, which is unfortunate and uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. I would describe this as uncomfortable more so than scary. It talks about how he has rigged up motion sensitive cameras in the main bedroom. There's a great gag that comes from this where they say, uh, what well, won't we set them off when we get up in the night? And he says, commando crawl underneath them. And so uh, when things end up happening in the night and they have to keep go coming and going between the lower and upper levels of the house, which is this split level set, they have to continually remember that the camera's there and then crawl underneath. Although I was sat in something like row E, I didn't get the best view of this because there's floor and it's happening slightly further back. So I think anything row E of the stalls forwards is going to have an obstructed and diminished appreciation of that visual gag. Mr. Cavendish, meanwhile, says these yield some of the earliest, most incandescent moments of startlement. We get flashbulb glimpses of Ella Shrey Yates's moody, ghost pale Janet in successive elevated and gymnastic postures as if propelled by an unseen force to the door, which I think was very well done. There's not quite enough where that came from. Unwin moves swiftly into the realm of overt psychological insinuation. There's talk of the girl's absent, possibly abusive father. A manifest need engrossed to treat Janet as the embodiment of and possibly conduit for his own deceased daughter. Spoiler alert, also called Janet. In theory, the play, less a whodunit than a who is doing it, I enjoy that technicality, straddles the threshold between the rationally explicable and the unfathomable, but it never quite crosses over from the watchable into the spine-tinglingly compelling. I mean, hey, at least he's calling it watchable. The cast, directed by Angus Jackson, are admirably committed. Lee Newby's domestic set, Julie, darkly oppressive. And if Tate keeping a careworn maternal lid on despair and hysteria sometimes looks uncomfortable in the wrong way, that may owe something to the flat, oddly insubstantial writing. All of which reads like he really didn't hate it, but expects more from the genre. Which is interesting to me, because just scanning through those last two, I feel like that two star from Dominic Cavendish in The Telegraph read more positively than Aretha's three star in The Guardian which is curious. However, it doesn't get better for the Enfield haunting from there. We have another two star, this time from What's On Stage. Sarah Crompton is a little more forthcoming with her feelings on this one, as she calls it a shocker in all the wrong ways. She says, this play about one of the most mysterious of all recent hauntings turns into a snooze fest, which doesn't seem to have a clue why it's interesting. I agree with you. Despite some flashing lights and ominous darkness, the only thing that goes bump in the night is the clank of Paul Unwin's script and the sound of Catherine Tate and David Threlfall ringing their agents 
asking how they ever got mixed up in this Farago. Farago? I've only ever seen it written, but good word. Now, because she said that, I do have to tell you a story from when I saw the show, because the ending wasn't clear. I mean, it was obvious with the blackout that it was an ending, but it felt like such an inconclusive way to finish the story and the script that when we had this blackout and Catherine Tate is left alone on stage in darkness, nobody applauded. Like there was a distinct lack of applause from the audience. And I've had this before at the Edinburgh Fringe where people just aren't sure whether or not to applaud. But this seemed to go on for longer than I've ever experienced before, an uncomfortable amount of time. And then some applause was started, but I was close enough to the stage to be able to place that it was coming from further than where I knew the front of the stage to be. It was coming from the cast in the wings and stage management, whoever, who were about to come on and bow. So they had to start the applause by themselves backstage. And what normally happens, as soon as you hear that first clap, the anxious British audience will go, oh yes, apologies, we're meant to all be clapping now, very politely. But weirdly, there were a good couple of seconds where you just heard that applause before everyone else joined in. It was really awkward. And that awkwardness was felt on stage because when the lights came up and David Threlfall walked out to join Catherine Tate in the center of the bows, she turned to him and immediately started saying something very fast. Full conversation, like not a subtle, like talking to you while I'm bowing conversation, like full head turned, full conversation very animated, not looking happy, talking to him, talking to him, talking to him, saying to him, go ahead and bow. He goes, does his solo bow. She does hers, smiles for the first and only time during this curtain call, back to him, continues talking as they leave the stage together. Very unusual, something I have never seen happen in a curtain call before. Subsequent to that, a clip has been doing the rounds on social media from an interview where she is asked why she is doing the play. And for those of you who don't know, Catherine Tate, a big TV star and comedian who had her own sketch show playing a bunch of different characters. She was then a Doctor Who companion opposite David Tennant, subsequently appearing alongside him in the West End. But her response when asked why she was doing this play was that £600,000 a week is a hell of a weekly wage in the West End, even for her. And that understandably has shocked people because that I think may be more than anyone has ever been paid in the history of theater. Which leads me to think one of a few things is happening here. Either she means 600,000 pounds makes for a great weekly wage and that's her entire fee for the production, which I could believe and is still a great amount of money, or she's just joking about it in a very, very dry way. But I don't actually believe she's making £600,000 a week because West End budgets in mounting a show are not the same as Broadway budgets. And if that was true, then the fee for her alone for the duration of the project would be £12 million, which is more than Sunset Boulevard cost in the West End. Anyway, back to the What's On Stage review. Talking about Catherine Tate now. Leave my family alone, she exclaims, which over the next 75 minutes is more or less the only thing she ever gets to say, aside from, I just want you all to get out of here and I'm not leaving my house. Tate is reliably watchable and warm, which I agree with, but it must have been difficult for her not to deliver gems such as this without heading into full comic mode. And she does get a laugh right at the beginning of the play, simply by being shocked and shrieking when her neighbor enters her home. But there are very few opportunities for her to be funny for the rest of it. And you wonder why they mounted this and thought, yes, Catherine Tate, you're the right person for this. I think she's a deceptively good dramatic actress, as I would argue we saw in Doctor Who, but she's such a naturally gifted, brilliant comedian. Why would you not write a part for her where she can utilize more of those skills? Admittedly, it's not really conducive to this kind of a play, but then why have her in this play at all, other than having 600,000 pounds to offer her? Oh, this is a great sentence. Threlfall is similarly lumbered as Gross, who potters vaguely around the action, trying to calm things down and explaining that a poltergeist is drawn to unhappiness and usually to teenage girls, but seems remarkably unconcerned when a gas fire is ripped from the wall. A subthread of plot about his own dead daughter makes very little sense, but it's the entire thing around which the play ends up orbiting. Like as soon as that revelation comes, whether or not the poltergeist is real or not doesn't seem to matter to anyone anymore. The real mystery here is why the Enfield Haunting, directed by Angus Jackson, is so crushingly bad. Unwin has a track record as a writer of TV detective series such as Poirot and the hospital drama Casualty, as we've already heard. He knows how to create scripts that have texture that combine the thrill of discovery with the psychology of a family under pressure. Yet here, his writing seems to have no line. The interest of the tale lies in the tension between 
whether Janet and her sister Margaret are making things up or whether 284 Grace Street truly is in the grip of the supernatural. Sarah Crompton says that the illusions are brief and noisy rather than frightening. The audience was ready to be scared and thrilled, but the entire show is as disappointing as a wet Halloween. And going back to the paragraph before, I agree completely. The interest of the tale lies in the tension between whether Janet and her sister Margaret are making things up or whether it's actually haunted. And we never get a satisfying, conclusive answer. Visually, it's suggested to us as an audience that the hauntings are real. We see this paranormal, terrifying figure. We get no explanation for the majority of the things that happen throughout the show. But at the end, Catherine Tate chastises her children for making the whole thing up and they seem to apologize for it. But we don't get enough of an explanation as to the extent to which they actually did. Ultimately, it feels as though both things may be true, which is not a brilliant dramatic solution. Now, I think I told you this was a two star review and it read distinctly more negatively than the last ones. That's because it's actually a one star review. And Stage Door has it listed as a two, but at the bottom of that review, it is definitely a one. Let's head over to Cindy Margolina's thoughts in Broadway World. Now this actually is a two-star review. She says it's the late 1970s and an unassuming council house in North London is seemingly tortured by moving furniture and disembodied voices. We've all been there. Talking about the historical context and the background. And then Cindy, I love you for this. The Enfield haunting was meant to open to the press in early December, but was mysteriously postponed due to cast illness right when a substantial amount of negative feedback from the audience seems to appear on social media. I think you're allowed to acknowledge that you've heard about that as a critic. We don't have to act brand new and just deliver the party lines that the production has reported. Do a little bit of journalism, just like Cindy Marcolina has. Originally much longer, it's now dwindled to a mere hour and 15 minutes. It's enough for Catherine Tate and David Threlfall to send a chill down our spine and not precisely in a good way. Angus Jackson directs a sloppy script that goes nowhere. It's difficult to say what the play means or why it exists on a main stage for prominent theatre. A dialogue devoid of any linguistic beauty that manages to avoid both pragmatism and curated craft is an astonishing accomplishment for an established writer. That is a withering, accurate couple of sentences. Buried deep into stratified nothing is probably something about the real demons actually being inside of us. There's a weak attempt at a class discourse, we've heard this before, and a pointless recurring discussion on the threats of domestic violence, grief, and the inability to move on also make an appearance. Catherine Tate's uh, attempts to be a working class icon with feminism as her core value falls flat on deaf ears when everybody else reinforces the patriarchal structure of 70s moors. Oh, we're really cutting into it here. If its mere presence in the West End weren't borderline offensive, the Enfield haunting would end up being accidentally funny. While the material is utter rubbish, there are a few elements to praise, primarily Lee Newby's set design being a thing of beauty. He slices the Hodgson's home open, kind of like a doll's house, exposing the layers of insulation and naked brick to reveal the drab grey surroundings of a council house. Neil Austin's lighting, deserving of a mention with its brilliant pools of light streaming in from the curtained windows. Yeah, all, all excellent. And then praise for Ella Shrey Yates in her West End debut, delivering an impressively physical performance as the maybe possessed, maybe lying Janet. A note here which no one else has made, but I do agree with, Tate and Threlfall are an unfortunately ill-assorted duo. They fail to build any sort of tension and full sort of any potential chemistry between them. We also, we're constantly misled and redirected about what this relationship is. Is she comfortable with him being in her house? She talks about resenting their presence at the beginning and then she sort of reveres him later. There's this odd moment of romantic chemistry and then this class resentment but none of it is sophisticated or cohesive or recurs everything is played in an instant and almost all of these characters do the same thing that Catherine Tate's does because the writing is wildly inconsistent everyone enters in one mood with one intention and has pivoted completely by the end the other daughter the not possessed one Margaret played by Grace Maloney also has this issue. I think Grace Maloney does a very good job, but the character is all over the place because she's rude and entitled and in the midst of all of this chaos around her, completely unlikable because she's seemingly trying to solicit some sort of sexual attention from uh, Mr. Gross, the much older man who is trying to look after her possibly possessed sister. It's weird. Cindy finishes by saying, be aware that there are better ways and better plays to invest cash on. I don't know if that's directed at audiences or at the show's producers. Mm -hmm. 
finally, let's continue descending down with another one-star review from Sam Marlow in The Stage, which calls it coarse, clumsy, and fright-free. Marlow says, Catherine Tate and David Threlfall struggle to enliven this flat-footed, frisson-free retread of the famous 1970s poltergeist case. Could we have a little moment for that alliteration there? Flat-footed and frisson-free. She says, theatre audiences love a spooky story, with the runaway commercial success of 222 A Ghost Story, a recent prime example. I think, interestingly enough, that's not an indication to me that theatre audiences love a spooky story. That says to me theatre audiences love seeing celebrities on stage because 222's ongoing success at like five different West End theatres was because of their very clever casting approach, bringing in people like Lily Allen and Tom Felton from Harry Potter and Stephanie Beatrice and Girls Aloud member Cheryl, for crying out loud, who was actually surprisingly good. But that is also something that this show is trying to capitalise on with Catherine Tate and David Threlfall. Carrying on, it says, This ramshackle offering from Paul Unwin, co-creator of TV's Casualty, is certainly a shocker, but only, alas, because it is so astonishingly cack-handed and unambitious. <laughs> I have never heard of a play being called Cat Handed before. That's something my mother used to call me when I dropped something. <laughs> it's a retread of the notorious 1970s real life case of alleged poltergeist activity in a working class Enfield family home. Yada, 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 yada. Talking about the other adaptations. It's been squeezed dry. And it says that Angus Jackson's production is coarse, clumsy, and so fright free that it makes The Woman in Black look like The Exorcist. The Woman in Black, a play which had its fair share of jump scares but wasn't like terrifying throughout. Then, like most reviews, it talks it talks about the characters, it talks about the demonic possession. Even more dismaying, and I'm glad this is being talked about, is Unwin's treatment of the sisters at the centre of the case. The real Margaret and Janet admitted that at least some of what went on was a hoax, but Unwin is bizarrely incurious about the surrounding circumstances. How much did the turmoil of a female adolescence, the trauma of their absent father's alcoholism, or the simple longing for attention play a part? Here, and I've just told you about this because no one else had mentioned it, thank you Sam Marlowe, Grace Maloney's Margaret is a minxy flirt testing out her burgeoning sexuality on Threlfall's squirming gross and on a blundering neighbour, while Ella Shrey Yates's Janet remains a hunched, twitchy enigma. The siblings share an occasional conspiratorial glance, there is the odd cursory dash of cod psychology in Gross's musings, and a rushed denouement involving a tragedy in his own family history. It is, it is rushed. But the play's approach is far too flat-footed to lead anywhere but a dead end. That's exactly how I feel about it, actually. Lee Newby's designs deliver pungent period detail, lots of praise for his work here. Oh, it talks about the posters in the girls' bedroom. You know, I could not see any of those. Apparently, David Essex and Starsky and Hutch. Who knew? If that matters to you, sit in the circle. Janet's Scarlet 90, memorable from the famous photograph of her levitation as a visual motif, bright among the beige and grey. Yet even the illusions and jump scares are feeble, and the whole thing is as thin as a wraith and utterly pointless. Another supernatural stage hit in the making, not a ghost of a chance. In many ways, an unsuccessful ghost story on stage does give theatre critics many of opportunities to have a fun turn of phrase. I am enduringly deeply curious about the amount of material that must have been cut to reduce the show's running time by as much as it was shortened, because reflecting on it, the first scene with the neighbour where she keeps telling him that she wants him to leave so they can just get on with the family dinner and that he should just go back to his house and he doesn't leave and she keeps telling him that goes on for far too long. It's an uncomfortably long scene. My point being, what on earth was cut if all of that was kept in? Ah, now here's the Time Out review. Now, Time Out announced recently that they weren't going to publish star rating for anything lower than a three. So if it's lower than a three star review, aka a one or a two, it would simply be unrated. I'm of the opinion that you need to hop onto one side of the fence or the other, but sitting on it for too long is just going to become a pain in the ass. Because showing anything that's a three, four or five star review so that you can get on the posters with the fives and be like, yay, five stars from Time Out, but not showing the ones or twos because you don't want to be mean is pointless. Because if you don't have a star rating, then we know it's a one or a two. Aside from the fact that not putting a one or two star rating next to it doesn't take away from the fact you've called it bewilderingly dire. The Enfield Haunting dives straight in. As it begins, the activity has been ongoing for a while now, and single mum Peggy Hodgson is losing hope that any end is in sight for the bizarre events that seem to revolve around her daughter Janet. Unwin's script is a bewildering muddle which gestures at the fact that Janet and her sister Margaret admitted to having been on the wind-up, but then 
piles a load of wildly unsubtle, jump-scary supernatural stuff on top. Oh, I do enjoy how this man writes. It's unclear what any of the characters believe is going on because they don't really talk about it. Anytime something baffling and terrifying happens, they move on from it very quickly. As he says here, they all seem incredibly nonchalant about, say, a gas fire being ripped out of the wall by unknown forces while they're all upstairs. The tone teeters on the verge of comedy, but only really because the dialogue is all overripe approximations of 70s working class London dialect. Do we think it would work better as a comedy if they actually leaned into spoofing the entire thing and playing it for laughs? I think you'd enjoy it more. Certainly it's more fun laughing at the theatre than waiting for answers that never materialise while a play occasionally screams at you. There are attempts by Unwin to flesh out both Peggy and Morris but the play is so short that his brief attempts at adding depth just end up confusing matters. It's bewilderingly brief and feels like it could have done with at least another hour to introduce and examine the characters in an orderly fashion. Dear God, no. Any play that can't achieve something in 75 minutes does not deserve another hour of my time. Or yours. Tate and Threlfall both try their best, but they should be asking some very hard questions of their agents here. And I think we've already established Catherine Tate is talking to her accountant about this one and not her agent, which, you know, good for her, honestly. I think she does a good job in this. Director Angus Jackson hasn't exactly covered himself in glory, but I can't help but feel that the RSC veteran, that's the Royal Shakespeare Company, has been left fighting a desperate rearguard action with a terrible script. He salvages a couple of scares from this mess, but the most terrifying thing about the Enfield haunting is that nobody stepped in to stop it before it reached the West End. And I don't think we need to read any more reviews because we've said literally everything we can. We've said the most terrifying thing is the ticket price, the most terrifying thing is that nobody stopped this show. And with all of those critical reviews, we have heard the thing dissected seven different ways to Tuesday. The majority of which I wholeheartedly agree with. This was not a satisfying piece of theatre. It was neither scary enough nor incisive enough. For me, the enduring issues are the inconsistency in the writing of these characters, the lack of any kind of a focal point throughout, and the both uncomfortable and unnecessary sexual tension throughout. So that is The Enfield Haunting at the Ambassador's Theatre. Now, if, like me, you are a stubborn theatre-goer and you need to make up your mind for yourself, then I applaud you and you can get tickets to go and see the play in the West End. If you've seen it already, let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Make sure to subscribe to my channel for more reviews of West End shows and more theatre videos coming very soon. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>